Well, we're going to start at John chapter 8 this morning. I'm not going to cover most of the chapter like I normally would, but I want to just start with John 8, 12. And since this is the first Sunday of our year gathering together, it would have been last year. I was all ready with this message last, uh, last Sunday. But, you know, something interesting happens right after Christmas. Suddenly, people stop saying Merry Christmas, and what do they say? Happy New Year. And, and I, I was listening to that and hearing people say that, and I thought, why do we say Happy New Year? Is it just because we're glad to be done with last year? Are you glad to be done with last year? Yes, me too. <laughs> and so you have a brand new year to mess up. <laughs> you know, we don't want to just rush through this year and get to the end of the year and say, man, where did that year go? I can't believe it's already Christmas again. And that's what's going to happen. And when you do that, what does that say about you? It means you're old. <laughs> For you who are really old, it means you are getting old. That was a joke. And I thought, what does that mean? We say Happy New Year. And we say Happy New Year. It's this, this, we celebrate it, and it's over, and then back to, back to normal. Do you make New Year's resolutions? Let me see your hands. See, already a week and a half into it, January 10th, and you already forgot. I do not make New Year's resolutions. Do you know why? Because I don't want to feel bad about myself when I don't keep them. This whole idea of celebrating the New Year is way more than just a tradition, a holiday, it's more than just a party and then back to normal. And I just want to talk to you about what it would mean for you to have a great year, and a happy, not just a new year, but a happy year, better than last year. What would it take? What changes would need to happen in your life Now, the whole celebration of the new year, I looked up on the internet, and you know everything in the internet's true. But generally, according to, you know, the records of history, way, way back to Babylonian times, um, you know, they celebrated the new year, and before this time of year, January, where we celebrate the new year, it was really more in the springtime the March-April time, and the beginning of the new year would be the day in which uh, there was an equal portion of light and dark in that day. Because right now, it's not equal, is it? It's not equal and it's not fair. I mean, you could wake up at, any, at 3 and 7 and it looks the same outside. It's dark. And then what time does it start getting dark in the afternoon? I'm not sure. It's like 1 o'clock some days. I'm turning the lights on in my house. It's, it's, there should be some daylight during the day. I mean, it's just a, a little bit of daytime. But as spring is starting to come and there's more daylight, there would hit a day in which there would be equal light and dark. And before just a date on the calendar, that would be the day of the new year before what we know as the celebration of the new year. So what does that mean? The world was looking for the return of the sun to be a new beginning. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Are you with me? So Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Who made the world, the planets, the stars, the sun, the moon, the earth? God did. And in fact, you know, as part of creation, God designed that there would be 
days, weeks, months, and years. You guys know that God set it up that way. And in fact, not only would the new year be a beginning, but in fact, God intended for every day to have a new beginning. Do you know that? Don't you wake up and go, okay, it's a new beginning. And in fact, David says that God's mercies, they are new every morning. Every morning. God is the one who set it up this way. Do you know why we sleep? Do you know scientists, what scientists say is the reason that we sleep at night? Are you ready? We get tired. The scientists don't know the scientific reason for why we sleep. They, they might know what happens when we sleep. Our body refreshes, it, it restores, renews energy, all of that stuff. But why we suddenly get tired and, you know, those things... Well, the scientific answer is we get tired. The January date didn't happen until under Rome in 46 B.C. under Julius Caesar. He decided that January would mark the new year. Now, why January? You might not know, but our months, the names for our months and days are named after pagan gods. So January is named after the god Janus. Janus is the god of new beginnings, of gates and doors. And the god Janus had two heads, one looking forward, one looking back. So under the Roman system, Janus ruled the new beginning. And what does the media do at the end of the year, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day? They're looking back and they're looking forward. They're looking at all the trends of the past year, the fashion trends, the food trends. I am glad to tell you that one food trend of last year is over. Do you want to know what it is? Kale. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We can stop seeing kale salad at our potlucks. Now, if you're into it, go for it. But I spotted that one a long time ago, and I said, this is not going to last. This is not going to last. Kale. Uh-uh. I don't even know what it tastes like yet. And it's, that's just going to stay that way. The world has celebrated the new year. The Romans have celebrated the new year. But I want you to know that the fact that we have a cycle that gives us a new year is by God's design for you. It is intended to accomplish something. It's not just a holiday that marks time and we keep on moving. God created, again, the days, weeks, months, years, the cycles for these things to change. Why did He do it? To give us a sense of a new beginning. And that emotionally, it has that effect on us, doesn't, doesn't it? Yes? It feels good to be on to the next year. Now, we might in our brain say, well, it's the same as any other day. It's the same as any other year. But the truth is, I'm glad that we are done with last year. And we are ready to look forward to this year. The Jews... Now, under God's system, have actually two calendars, two new years. I don't know. They get extra holidays that we don't get. As a pastor, all of these holidays we have in America, they fall on what day of the week? Monday. Do you know what day is my day off? It's Monday. Now, the Jews have two new years. They have a civil calendar, and they have a religious calendar. The civil calendar would begin around September on our calendar, but Tishri on the Jewish calendar, and it would be, um, it's called Rosh Hashanah. I'm sure you've heard of that. That's the Jewish New Year on the civil calendar. Now, on the 10th of the month is the Day of Atonement, 
And on that day, the high priest would sacrifice a goat, a spotless, spotless goat, take the blood of that after preparing himself, cleansing himself, preparing his heart, and he would take the blood of that sacrifice into the Holy of Holies, where only he would go once a year. That place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God revealed his Shekinah glory, the high priest alone went into that place once a year and to atone for the sins of the nation on the Day of Atonement. He would prepare himself, cleanse himself, make himself right before God. And then he would go in and they would tie a rope around his leg. And around the hem of his robe would be bells that would jingle as he would go inside. And the people outside, the priests would listen for those jingle bells. Because as long as those bells were jingling, it told them that he was still alive. Because you see, if the high priest went in before God's presence and the glory of God unprepared, his heart is not ready, God would strike him dead. And if the bell stopped, what would the people do with that rope? They would pull him out. We need another high priest. Next. And if he would come out, that would mean, yes, indeed, God accepted the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people for that past year. Now, not only would they sacrifice a goat for the sins of the people, they would have a second goat. And then the priest would lay his hands on the head of that animal, symbolizing transferring the sins of the nation to that animal, and then they would take that live animal and drive him out into the wilderness, send him away. And the name of that goat was called the scapegoat. Literally, this whole idea that we say, well, I'm just your scapegoat, or we've put our, all of our blame on somebody else to take the blame for it, that comes from the Jewish New Year. Who is our scapegoat? Jesus Christ. But they would send out this goat off and they would pray that he would keep going because if that animal decided to come back, that was bad news. And there would be out there a priest watching to see if that scapegoat was going to keep going. And if he did indeed keep going, he would send a signal back into town and there would be this huge celebration that the scapegoat took their sins away. That's the civil new year. Now the religious new year begins at what Jewish holiday? You know what it is. It's Passover. Because that holiday celebrates when God delivered the Jews from slavery in Egypt. And that would have been March, April. We know when Easter is. Easter and Passover are similar times of year. But God said to the Jews, in slavery, when you celebrate this feast, it will be the beginning of months to you. This will be the beginning of months to you, and that's in Exodus 12. So Passover is the beginning of the religious or the spiritual year to the Jews. Regardless of whatever Egypt was doing, God said, this is your beginning. This is your new beginning. Now, does God want us to have a sense of a new beginning to this year? Of course. Why would this year be different or better from, than last year? Just because we, we hope the old problems are done? No. Let me give you four reasons why this year can and should be a happy new year. Number one, as I've already been saying, is that God has given us a new year. 
the fact that we have it is easily overlooked. And I want you to know that God has, number one, already given you an unblemished new year. I don't know if it's totally unblemished. You've had 10 days to mess it up, but not too badly so far. God has designed things to go in seasons. You know that passage in Ecclesiastes 3. To everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a, pl a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. And what tends to happen is we get into one particular season, maybe a time of mourning, a time of difficulty, and we think, I'm stuck there. I'm, this is my life now. And it's a season. If you just wait and trust the Lord, that season of pruning or refining is going to pass and spring is going to come. Don't get all cynical and despairing like, oh, whatever hardship you went through last year, it's going to plague you into this year. It will if you let it. It will if you don't make changes maybe that contributed to it. But God has intended there to be seasons. Your life, as well as our church, went through some refining, some pruning last year. But that pruning is going to bear more fruit. Whatever season you were in, if you were in a difficult season, let me say this to you, don't get stuck there. Do you hear me? Do not get stuck there. Move on. Secondly, God has given us His Son to cleanse us of our sin. In fact, He is our scapegoat. He is our atoning sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8, Paul says, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. God's part, He's given His Son. Our part, to come before Him with a sincere heart in the truth of God's Word. So number three, God has given His Word to guide us. What do I do differently to have a better year? Well, the best place to start is God's Word. Psalm 1, most of you know it. You've read it to your kids if you have kids. Blessed is the man whose, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate both day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that brings forth its fruit in its what? Season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Even a live tree drops its leaves. Even a fruit-bearing, healthy tree has seasons of dropping dead branches and dropping the leaves of the past season. But you know, during the dark months and the bare months, God is preparing that tree to begin to bear fruit for the next season. And that's what's happening in your life. I think that's what's happening in our church. Number four, God promises to answer our prayers. Why would this year be better than last year? God promises to answer our prayers. In Luke 11, Jesus said, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will knock, and it will be 
For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How is God going to guide you through this year? By his Spirit. A couple of weeks ago, one of my grandsons spent the night, River, five years old. I have three daughters. They're all married. Two of them have kids, and they're a crack up, and they wear me out. River was spending the night, and it was bedtime, and I said, come on, River, let's go, and, and we're going to pray. You know what River said to me? I don't pray. He just said it to me like that was just going to shut me down. I don't know. He just says, I don't pray. Now, my son-in-law, his dad, just got a new job. They're moving to Wyoming next year or this year, and he's going to be a police officer, uh, the state patrol, and he's in training right now. They, he's been preparing this for, for a couple of years, wanting to get into law enforcement. Finally gets this job opportunity, and his dad is at training now. But I said, River, it's pretty exciting that you're going to move to Wyoming. Your dad's got a new job. I said, River, do you know where that job came from? He goes, where? I said, God gave it to him. He did. And I said, and guess what? God has more things he wants to give you and your family that you don't even know about yet. He does. And I said, River, don't you think we should pray and get ready for those things? So he said, okay. <laughs> and we prayed. You know the things that just come your way, these good things? You might think that you earned it or it just happened to come to you, you made the right contact. But you know, the Bible says whatever we've received it's, uh, that's good, it's come from God. James says every good gift has come from our Father. Even when you weren't seeking Him, your Heavenly Father was watching out for you. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, the Bible says. But how much better would it be if you were seeking God? If, as we say, in the great theological phrase, if you would, how does it go? If you would, if you would, uh, oh, it, it was in my brain. What's the, what's the phrase? You want to you be under the spout where the glory comes out? How's that for some theology? Now, you can't make God bless you because God decides because he loves you, he's going to bless you. But can't we hinder God's good work in our lives because we're out of his will, because we're off doing our own thing? And so God, God initiates blessing you, but God forbid that you would hinder the things that God wants to do. What should you do? Here's just a few questions. Number one, do I love God first? It all starts there. Not do I believe God loves me. Do I love God? Have I put the Lord first in my life? Now, in principle, you might want to live that way, but look at the way you're living. Is that actually the way you're living? Are you putting God first in the way that you use Time, money, energy, your abilities. You see, that proves if God is first or not. Secondly, do you love people? Yes, the ones that don't bug me. Because you see, the evidence that we know God is that we love his people. There are a lot more things that God is going to do in your life, but it's all going to flow out of those two things. That you actually love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, 
and you love your neighbor as yourself. Here's a third question. What gift or ministry are you neglecting? Some, something that God asked you to do, whether here in the church or, or in your life, and you set it aside because it was too hard, you were met with some challenge, because you got distracted with a trial or a difficulty. As Paul said to Timothy, stir up the gift that God has given to you. Stir it up. It's still there. Number four, as I've already mentioned, am I wasting time or money? We have a lot of free time. We have a lot of free time. And you're allowed free time. You're allowed to goof off and rest. Number five. This is where it gets really personal. You ready? Who do you need to forgive? Has somebody offended you that you're holding a grudge and you are so right? Now, why is that important? Because your bitterness toward them is coming between you and the Lord. Forgive them. Let it go. Is there some justice that needs to be followed up? You know, Paul said in Romans, let, let God deal with that. Give place to wrath, which means let God deal with it. Because God's way of dealing with difficult people is way better than what you could do. Amen? What does God want for our church? It's a new year for our church, which I am excited to be done with last year. Again, everything is going to flow out of our love for the Lord, our love for each other, and here's the key. You stirring up the gifts that God has given to you. Because God's work in the church is not a program that we manufacture. It is the moving of His Spirit in His people. It's you. Now, what's my job? Do you know that my whole job is simply this, is to serve you? To serve you for what purpose? As Paul said in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, that Christ has given to the church ministers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. I'm only one part in this church. We are the whole body, and so as I equip you, you're the one who is going to say, this is what God has put on my heart to do. Can we do it? And it's my job to support you and equip you. I really can't think of everything that needs to be done. It probably drives me crazy more than anything else, is what do we need to do about, you know, the different activities that run through the church calendar? Should we do this? Should we have this picnic? Should we have this retreat? Should we do this? And frankly, I don't know. And we... We try and make the right decisions, but that's where, where you help us. How can we serve you better? What are the ministries God's put on your heart to do that we can, can equip you to do? That's all I'm here for. To help you to grow in the Lord. Whether it's, you know, here around the church, every area of the church should be should be occupied by somebody who is excited to be in that place whether it's an usher a children in children's ministry on the worship team a missionary that we know that God has called and equipped you in that area if we, any of us is serving in anything where we're grumpy and complaining and ungrateful is God blessed by that? Absolutely not. But the greatest gift you can give is your life to serve others 
and you are excited to do it because you know God's put it in your heart to do. And that's exciting for me. As Mark and I go to Nashville this week to search out missions opportunities, we are only going to see the opportunities. It is then what's going to happen is you're the ones who are going to say, well, I can do this, and I can do this, and let me organize this. And God's just going to just use this opportunity to raise you up to do the work of the ministry. We're all here for the same reason, to be conformed to the image of Christ, to grow into his image. Whether it's the little kids upstairs, or a women's Bible study, a men's Bible study, or Sunday morning, we're all doing it together. We're all here saying, Lord, we love you. Help us to know you. What I pray for you is that you would let go of old things. If any man is in Christ, old things pass away, all things become new. Whatever bad patterns you fell into last year, put it away. And let the Lord make this new year a year that is going to be blessed and amazing. That when, when you said Happy New Year, you didn't mean January 1st. Only. Today we're going to receive communion together. And what a perfect opportunity because the bread and the cup, they are the symbols of the cross of Jesus Christ, His body beaten for us, His blood shed for us. These, are the, these symbols literally came out of the Passover supper. And at Passover, God said, this shall be the beginning of the year to you. This is a brand new start. And for all of us who have come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it, it is, that's the place where our life became new. And if you don't have that sense of an excitement for this year, I encourage you to, to take this moment to ask the Lord to wash away old things. Whatever fatigue or sin or depression or whatever darkness came in and kind of beat you up last year, it was a season. It wasn't for good. It wasn't permanent. And just say, Lord, you're the one that's going to make it a new year, a new season. Lord, thank you for this first Sunday we've gathered together of the new year. And we pray that we're able to say and keep saying that it's a happy new year. It's a blessed new year. Resolutions pass, but the revolution that takes place in our heart, Lord, is lasting. Lord, as we go out from here, may there not be an anxiety that we have to force anything to happen, but to rest in your will, in your strength, in your work, that we can, we can just walk in faith and watch the work you're going to do. Lord, bless as we go out from here, and thank you for the sunshine. We pray in your name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.